Nine Bell players this morning. Nice to have all of you here. Uh, I'm Pastor Zarling. Welcome to Water of Life Lutheran Church to our Caledonia campus. What we've been doing for Bible study is uh, use, going through the scripture readings and then uh, just having a deeper understanding of each of the readings. Uh, so if you have, a, have the Bible study there, and then also you might want to have the bulletin. You can use this, the Pew Bibles, but uh, all of the readings are in the bulletin as well. So the, the theme for today is, through the word, the triune God blesses us. And then the theme paragraph, the scriptures never use the word trinity or triune. They never even summarize in any single place the entirety of this doctrine. Indeed, as we read God's word from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation, he gives us hints and glimpses of his triune nature. Thus, the doctrine of the trinity can seem very academic even abstract. It may seem to have little relevance to the Christian's daily life. Nothing could be further from the truth. Instead, as God provides those hints and glimpses, his primary focus is on the way in which his triune nature is a blessing to us. God shows us how we benefit from the fact he exists as Trinity. God dwells in a majesty and mystery. You'll hear that phrase in the prayer of the day. That far exceeds our understanding. But here is what we can understand. Every time we gather in the name of the Lord, our triune God, we receive indescribable blessings. All right, John chapter 16. So this is the gospel lesson for today. So Jesus is in the upper room, and it's Thursday of Holy Week. And he says, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I said that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. So the first question, what things did Jesus promise the Spirit would do when he would come? Okay, guide us. What else? So he's going to guide his disciples in all truth. Yes, sir. What's that? Yeah, okay. And so he's going to tell the things that are going to come. And... He's going to bring glory to Jesus. Notice what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. Uh, so for those of you who are guests, uh, I'll talk about this later in the announcements that we have a podcast from Water of Life that we call Thirsty. Uh, and it's on the Raised with Jesus podcast. You can find it on different uh, apps like Podbean or Stitcher and so forth. And uh, one of the things that Pastor Lightnin from Shoreland, who's a member of Water of Life, what he talked about is, uh, in the podcast, is that the Holy Spirit is kind of like the silent partner in the Trinity. You know, he's often quiet in what he does. And yet, what is his role? Uh, that's going to that's get to the la third question. Uh, were the disciples ready for what lay ahead? Yeah, exactly. Not before Pentecost. So why is it so essential that the Holy Spirit would guide the disciples to know the truth? So if they weren't ready... Exactly. That's the key. Remember, this is Thursday. In just a few hours, they're going to see Jesus arrested, or first betrayed and then arrested. And then uh, only John is going to be there at the crucifixion. Uh, and they're, they're confused. Even after the resurrection, 
they're confused. They're still confused at the ascension as they're gathered probably on the Mount of Olives and Jesus is preparing them for his ascension. They still wonder if this is going to be a physical kingdom. And like Ben said, it's not until the 50 days after the resurrection that they finally get it with the coming of the Holy Spirit as he guides them in truth. Now getting into what I was referencing before of the Holy Spirit kind of being that silent partner in the Trinity. The Spirit's goal is, to bring it, is not to bring attention to himself. What is his goal? Look at verse 14. His goal is to always focus on, on Jesus. Pastor Lightning talked in the podcast about a pastor that wanted to do a sermon series highlighting the Holy Spirit. Another pastor told him, that's going to be difficult to do because the work of the Holy Spirit is not to highlight himself. It's always to highlight Jesus. Any questions that you have on that gospel lesson? I think that we have three very short scripture readings today because we get the really long Athanasian Creed today. Uh, one of my members put on Facebook, because I, all I did on Friday and Saturday, I just shared Athanasian Creed memes. You wouldn't even think there was such a thing, but uh, there is. And one of my members commented and tagged me in it saying, all right, come to Trinity Sunday, but service is going to be 15 minutes longer because of the Athanasian Creed. I said, it only takes four and a half minutes while we're standing. He said, it felt long when I was typing it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, he said, uh, it's four, four and a half minutes, but because you're standing, it'll feel like 15 minutes. A second reading from Romans chapter 5. Paul writes, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom... We also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces patient endurance and patient endurance produces tested character and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the first question, because of our justification, our relationship with God is now changed. What is justification? It's a good, good Christian term, good Lutheran term. Ah, I like that. That's his. All right. So uh, in our podcast that we do is we always have a guest. And yesterday's guest was Pastor Ben Foxen, who is Pastor Lightning's brother-in-law. I saw them today just before I left the Racine campus and came up here. And Pastor Foxen uh, was... Right out of the seminary, he went to Novosibirsk, Russia, for about six years. And then he took a call and was in, I think, Peoria, Arizona, for six years. And then yesterday, he was installed and commissioned to be a missionary in Lusaka, Africa. So he was at worship today. And uh, one of the things that we talked about then is... What Pastor Fox instead of for justification is, you know, describing it as a judicial term. That God the Father is the judge, you and I are the defendants, we're guilty. And yet because Jesus is the, the defense attorney, with the devil being the prosecuting attorney, Jesus, through Jesus, God says to us, you're not guilty. So that's justification. Being declared innocent. What is peace with God? 
Peter says, I mean, Paul says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is peace? You don't have to worry about anything. We're saved. What else? Yes, sir. No one's going to bother you. You're at, at peace. Uh, that no matter what's going on, we'll look at that peace a little bit later on when we look at the benediction in the next scripture reading. But, you know, if you're a teenager, you're an adult, people can be bothering you all the time. And the world is bothersome. And yet we're at peace. A peace, Jesus says in uh, the last, last week's scripture readings, of it's a peace that the world cannot bring. And Paul says it is a peace that is beyond human understanding. And what does it mean that we've gained access to God's grace? Verse 2, through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace. What does this mean? We've gained access. Okay, I didn't think of it that way. So you're talking about how God is, the blessings are coming this way. I was thinking of the blessings going this way. What blessings are going this way from us to God that we've gained access? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. We can pray, right? That we have, just in the worship service today, there's the prayer of the day, the prayer of the church. We'll have our intercessory prayers for a number of our members. We'll have... Uh, a prayer for Pastor Baldwin, whom we've called to be our second pastor. We'll have the prayer at the end of the worship, the Lord's Prayer. All of those that we can come to God, the Father's throne of grace, with our prayers, because Jesus has opened up that to us. Uh, next question. Paul says in verse 5, Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings. Why does a Christian rejoice in suffering? Why does it, I mean, it, Paul sounds like he's lost his mind, right? He rejoices in suffering. Why would a Christian rejoice in suffering? So, yes, ma'am. And um, I was thinking of the refining of the gold and um, burning off of the dross and um, purifying. You must have heard a couple, a couple of pastors talk about that in the past. Yeah. yeah. Whole Your whole life. Yeah, that's a great uh, Old Testament imagery of the burning off of the dross uh, for refining gold and metals. You know, I would watch uh, Forged in Fire. Okay. And you know you have to you have to melt all of that, you kind of heat it up to a, a certain temperature. Not so hot that you burn the metal, but you got to get that right temperature. Uh, I use these verses this week in two devotions over the phone with our members. Uh, Sandy was going in for cancer surgery on Thursday, and then, and her previous cancer surgery was 11 years ago, and then. We're also praying today for Joan Brem, who fell and fractured her shoulder. And then while she was getting up and going to sit down, she fell again and fractured some more. Okay, but I, I, I talked about with both, uh, with both of our ladies, this verse. I said that God is allowing you to go through these sufferings because that produces patient endurance. We can't be patient and learn how to endure unless we go through suffering. And then as we are enduring, now we receive a t tested character. And I said to them, people in your family, 
your fellow members in our church, they see the kind of character that you have. They may not know what you've gone through, but they follow you and they listen to you because of your character. And then that character, Paul says, produces hope. And that confidence in Christ that no matter what's going on in your life, you're going to get through it because God is there. But I'll say this in the sermon. We don't get to that place of hope unless we've first gone through suffering. All right, so small group. So get together with a couple of people around you and talk about for a minute or two. I want you just to talk to each other of an example of how suffering has been a blessing in your spiritual life. All right, and then let's see if you're willing to share with that. So talk to someone, a group of people around you, however, for a minute or two about that question. How has uh, suffering been a blessing in your spiritual life? Okay, does anyone want to share? Yes, ma'am. Okay, one of those people who has a to-do list that's 10 miles long, and I never can get to everything, and then he suddenly has to have emergency surgery along the to-do list. It's just a little bit tiring, just to move. That reminds me that yesterday I was biking with my oldest daughter, Abby, and she was wondering if I had had shoulder surgery a dozen years ago or so. And I said, no, I, because she remembered me having severe pain. You know, I remember playing basketball back in one of the pastures I was playing with. I went up for a shot and he followed me. Not real hard, but it just shot through my arm. It was bad. I couldn't even hold, hang clothes up. And I told her I went to the doctor and he sent me to a physical therapist and the lady was asking all the questions beforehand said so how long have you had this pain and I said ah over a year maybe two years and she looked at me and said what took you so long to come see us then I said I'm a guy <laughs> and she she said she laughed and said oh I understand what you mean but I can't write that down you know, give me another reason but yeah you learn things through suffering okay uh, again, going back to yesterday's podcast, Pastor Fox, and he talked about how the Russian people that he ministered to in Novosibirsk, and which means no, New Siberia, so it's like the capital of Siberia, and it's not probably a great place to live. And he said, yet, those people there, they're just so hungry for learning anything that here in America, a lot of our churches will have ESL cl classes, English as Second Language for Hispanics. And they kind of, that was their ministry, that the people there in Nova Zabirsk really wanted to learn English. And the way they did it was 
teaching the Bible lessons and reading through the Bible. They're excited to learn, but through their suffering, then you can learn about, about God. But if everything's going well, then forget about God. Anyone else want to share? What have you learned through suffering? It's a number of years ago now, but um, I was going through a difficult period in our family life as far as the different things that were happening in our uh, life as a pastor, also with some of the setbacks that came about. And uh, God picked that time for me to be assigned to preach at a pastoral conference. Mm. And so I, I used a passage like the one before us and we used the imagery of tunnel, that a tunnel has two ends to it, unless you get off inside the tunnel. And so you, the picture then it becomes when you're suffering, you begin to think about woe is me and the kind of pity that you have on yourself. And left to yourself, you would get, out, get off in the tunnel. But God gives us not only the strength that he promises to be able to go through all the way to the end, but also you begin to recognize more and appreciate more the support system that you have. Whether it was my wife, my mom, my grandma at that time, or the, the people, even young people, that I had in Youth for Christ, uh, how their encouragement helped to get me through it. Mm -hmm. That's finally what Yeah, that reminds me of uh, a number of years ago, we, our family did a family vacation at Elroy Sparta bike trail. And there's three tunnels on the trail, two that are short enough. Uh, one you just go right through, another one that's a little longer. You, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you still want your flashlight. And then there's one that's really long and it's dark. You get in the middle, you can turn off your light and you can't see anything. And uh, you know, so if you really wanted to be mean, you could kind of stand on the side and then kind of jump out at people. Uh, but yeah, uh, but if you were in the middle of that tunnel and your light went out and you would get disoriented, you wouldn't know which way is to go and so forth. And so yeah, you need the other people with you. Uh, let's finish up with that last reading, uh, number six. The Lord told Moses to speak to Aaron and to his sons and to tell them to bless the Israelites with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. In this way, they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. What does the name Lord in all capital letters convey? Okay, all powerful. But that can also be contained in the name God and God Almighty. So there's something special about this one. Could it mean the Savior God? Yeah, the Savior God, uh, Adonai, uh, Jehovah. Yeah, this is the I am from the burning bush. Uh, as Pastor Lightman mentioned in the podcast, because I say it's the God of the covenant, which is true, but he said it's more general. It's the Lord uh, the Lord is the God who keeps his promises. Even if they're law, I preached last week for Pentecost on the Tower of Babel, and I talked about the name of the Lord being a God of grace because even though he's bringing down this powerful judgment that is still felt countless generations later of confusing the languages, it was out of love because God says in Revelation that the gospel is meant for all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages. Well, God, the Lord, creates all peoples, tribes, nations, and languages at the Tower of Babel. So it's the Lord. Uh, it's the God who keeps his promises when you have all capital letters. The word Lord is repeated three times in the Aaronic benediction. It's called Aaronic because it's given to Aaron, Moses' brother. Why do you think the word Lord is repeated three times in these few verses. Yeah. I think it's the Trinity. 
It brings to mind the triune nature, and it's focusing on God's faithfulness to his promises. I didn't write this down here because I wrote the sermon after I wrote the Bible study, but you'll get a little tip when I talk about this in the sermon. How many times is the word you mentioned in these verses? I'll let you count them. The Lord is mentioned three times. Six times. What do you think the significance of, not that the number six means anything, but why do you think it's you is so emphasized twice as much as the Lord? I never, I, I preached on this probably three, three or four times in 25 years in the ministry, and this is the first time I've picked up on this. So if you don't get it right away, it's okay. And so this is the weird thing about the English language. You don't know if it's singular or plural, right? In the Hebrew, it's singular. So what I'll say in the sermon is that even though the Lord is giving this the very first time to the assembly of the Israelites who are camping at the base of Mount Sinai, and it's you, plural, when Aaron gives the blessing, it's you, singular. Like you are the only one in the room. So I want you to think of this. When I give these words to you, and when you go back to Trinity or wherever your home congregation is, uh, when the pastor, when you hear that word, because I'll I put this in there too in the sermon, that you've probably heard this at least 50 times a year. Okay, this, this blessing. So think of it 50 times. When you hear this, the Lord is speaking specifically to you, singular, as if you're the only one out of the in that room, even though there's 150, 200 people in the church. He's emphasizing the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. He's emphasizing the point. You, you, you. Because we don't get it very often, right? Uh, how do the words, the Lord bless you and keep you, reflect the Father's work? So what I want to do here is, and this is kind of the, the point of the sermon, in that we hear these words so often that we forget what they mean. Uh, familiarity breeds contempt. So I want to focus on this. What do each of these phrases mean? The Lord bless you and keep you. How does the Lord bless you? Preservation. Okay, preservation. So physical? Okay, the spiritual comes along with it, but yep. the promise is how he keeps you from it. Yeah. So that's how he, he blesses you physically and spiritually and then keeps you. Uh, keeps you, preserving you from physical danger, defending you from a spiritual harm. Okay? How do the words the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, bring to mind the work of the sun? Okay? And then focusing on the sun, what I've written down is, think of Luther's explanation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. He speaks this way of Christ. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil. And now he shines on you. Uh, his face is shining on you. And what I'll say in the sermon is, you know, think of, when you've seen a, a young athlete injured on the field, and when it's really bad, the parents go out onto the field, and yet everything's all right when the kid sees dad's face. Mom's okay, but dads have that special power of just being dad. Everything's all right when dad's there. Well, everything's all right when we see dad's face, God the Father's face through his son. And then how do the words, the Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace, reveal the work of the Holy Spirit? That's good. That's better than I had. 
What else? It is, peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. How about that look, with, look on you with favor? What does it mean when Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is, why is he crying that out? What has God the Father just done to him? Yeah, he's turned his back on him. Yeah, he's suffering now because he's turned his back on him. Because God the Father turns his back on his son, what does he do to us? Yeah, yeah, for us, and then if his back is to Jesus, where's his face pointing? On us. And then that gives us peace. And the Holy Spirit's the one that brings us that peace through the sacraments. Uh, let's go to... Yes, sir. I like that. Uh, say that again louder. <laughs> when God turned his, the Father turned his face away from his So when the Father turns his face away from his son, there's darkness. It's darkness. When he turns his face away from us, there's darkness. And when God turns his face away from us, there's darkness. Good. I love it. We're going to skip down to the end because I want to give all of you enough time for the... Uh, the pre-service music. We're going to watch a video. Maybe you've seen this one before, but this is a classic for uh, St. Patrick's Bad Analogies. Have, you, have any of you seen this? All right. We're going to watch this and then talk about it. Time. So I'll try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying, laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms, liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism. A heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously... I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Modalism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an apple. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is 
is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, quit beating around the bush, Patrick. Now let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. So what do you guys do for a living? Well, we come from a long line of snake farmers, Patrick, but truth be told, business has been real bad lately. Oh. Yeah, about that. All right. So we got, just to finish up, uh, you, any of you heard any of those bad analogies used by pastors in the past? Yeah. Uh, I asked this question in the podcast. I said, what kind of bad analogies have you heard? And Pastor Foxen tried ruining everything by saying, there are no good analogies. I said, well, let's play along. Okay. And then I started quoting this. And then finally, when I got to the Voltron thing in the podcast, Pastor Leighton then said, you're just ripping off the Lutheran satire video. I said, yeah. But the key is, I've heard all of those two. I haven't used any of them. It, because you can't explain the Trinity. I'll talk about the stained glass windows in our, uh, in the children's devotion today, and that talk about the Trinity. And the key is, when you think you understand the Trinity, then you're wrong. So when you, when you don't understand the Trinity and you admit that, that's probably when you're right. Uh, to finish up for the prayer, uh, let's use the psalm of the day. So if you want to open your hymnals to Psalm 8. So we'll sing it in a few minutes in worship, but let's also sing it here. <clears throat> 